May 11th, 1997, New York City. A room in which two opponents are facing each other. On one side, there is a cold, unfeeling machine. On the other side, there is a reasoning, feeling, loving human being. This was considered the machine versus the man. Those who still wanted to believe that the human intelligence was stronger than the computer, they expected for this. Before I continue my speech, please raise your hands if you have ever played a chess against a computer. So anyone chess? Yeah? You, sir, did you win or lose? Yeah, you. So what was the level of the computer program? Elementary, intermediate, advanced? Beginner. Beginner, elementary. OK. So think of a computer that can consider 200 millions of possible moves per second. And a man, a man who is the creator of that machine, can consider only one or two per second. That was the situation in that room on that day. On one side, there was a man who is still considered the greatest chess player history has ever seen. A man who was born in this city, Baku, Gary Kasparov. On the other side, however, there was a machine with primitive chess knowledge. A machine that was created by IBM team and called Deep Blue. It took only 19 moves to perplex Kasparov and 62 minutes to make him resign. The result was met with astonishment and grief by those who took it, at, who took it as the submission of human brain, human intelligence before the almighty computer. I could feel, I could sense new kind of intelligence across the table. That's what Kasparov said after his defeat. Today, by only spending 30, 40 bucks, you can buy sophisticated software that can play chess as well as Deep Blue did. But that game, on that day, the man versus the machine, Deep Blue versus the, uh, Kasparov, it was just called history. Because it was that game that brought up some questions that had been asked by some decades. Can machines think? Can we, can we humans, create intelligent machines? But what would it mean for a computer to be intelligent? What does it mean to be artificially intelligent? John McCarthy, one of the founders of artificial intelligence research, once defined the field as getting computers to do things which, when done by people, are said to involve intelligence. We can categorize this kind of things, tasks, into two groups. The first group is called mundane tasks. People almost do this kind of task automatically, but yet they require quite complex reasoning. Not language processing, we speak, we understand. Robotics, we see things, we move our hands, we move our feet. Vision, we see things, we analyze them. These kind of tasks are considered mundane tasks. The other tasks, the other kind of tasks are called expert tasks, which require specialized skills and training. Financial planning, medical diagnosis, computer configuration are this kind of tasks. But let's say we have an artificial system. We created it. How can we define, how can we determine if it's intelligent or not? What's the basis here? Back in 1950, Alan Turing, a computing engineer proposed a test, imitation game, or the Turing test, to determine whether a computer program, a machine, displays human level intelligence. In practice, some kind of, uh, some kind applications of this test require a machine, require a machine to engage in a dialogue and convince the human judge that it's an actual human being. To pass this test, to pass the Turing test, a machine would need some skills. It would need machine learning skills to learn from its environment. It would need 
knowledge representation skills to store knowledge and represent it. It would need natural language uh, processing skills to communicate like we do in Azerbaijani, in English, or in Russian. Even back in the 1950s, it was a hot topic to translate one language to another to understand the speech. IBM even undertook a research project that was uh, sponsored by the US government to translate scientific journals from Russian to English. At first, they thought this could be done straightforwardly. They were just going to use Russian English dictionary and some simple algorithms to rearrange the order of words in the sentence. But obviously, this simple approach was not enough. It wasn't successful. One simple reason that the words in a text can mean different things in different contexts, in different parts of speech. And uh, according to one uh, famous anecdote, the Russian equivalent of the Russian equivalent of sp uh, the sp spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Translated into something, the vodka is strong, but the uh, meat is rotten. Sorry, I forgot to uh, introduce my friend Alabash here. <laughs> He's my robot friend. Uh, as you can see, robotics is another showcase of another showcase of artificial intelligence. There is a competition called RoboCup, which is held every year. This RoboCup competition is about uh, the ro teams of robots that play chess. And last year, it was held in Brazil at the Real World Cup, too. And there is a uh, ping pong player, ping pong robot, that's called Kuka, that will play a game against one of the best ping pong table tennis players in the world. One another accomplishments of artificial intelligence came again from IBM team. They created a machine and called it Watson. Watson is a machine, an artificial intelligent program that plays Jeopardy. If you don't know Jeopardy, what Jeopardy is, Jeopardy is a game show that features quiz competition that the contestants are presented general knowledge clues in the form of answers and are required to phrase their responses in, uh, in form of questions. Watson re played against two best players in the world and won one million dollars. Yeah, that was a huge deal too. But what does it mean if we succeed in artificial intelligence? What would happen? I mean, yes, we create robots, we create games. What, what's the end goal here? Using artificial intelligence successes, we can avoid wars, we can cure diseases, we can cure cancer. Just think about it. Think about a robot, maybe my friend Alabash next year, comes to this stage and gives a TED talk. Because X Prize and TED have announced a new prize that will be presented to, a, to an artificial intelligent machine that will come to the stage and give a TED talk, which is compelling enough to win a standing ovation from the audience. Okay. Some say this artificial intelligence success would be the biggest event in the history. And perhaps, perhaps the very last. Some doomsday scenarios say robots will enslave us and even destroy us. Just imagine a robot that's originally programmed to cure cancer, but decides it concludes that the best way to cure cancer or to stop cancer is to terminate, exterminate the people who are genetically to, prone to disease. That would be a disaster, wouldn't it? Imagine a situation where your firefighter is a robot. How could it define if it's a kid or if it's a, uh, another old people? If it's, if it's dead, almost dead, or if it's still alive? 
it would be a disaster too. Some of the great minds of our time, like the founder of SpaceX, co-founder of Tesla X and PayPal, Elon Musk, he also, uh, he also said his concerns uh, over this topic. He thinks artificial intelligence is our biggest existential threat. He thinks it's like summoning demon. The story is that the guy has all tools, all the work that ne that's necessary, and he's sure that he can control the demon. And in the end, it doesn't work out. It's doomsday. Bill Gates also agrees with him on this topic. Actually, there are some artificial programs that we use almost every day. Please raise your hands if you own an iPhone. Yeah, I think Steve Jobs will be proud. Please raise your hands if you have ever used Siri. Yeah. Yeah. You guessed right. Siri is also an artificial intelligence program. It listens to you and does what you say. And Apple is not the only company that invests in artificial intelligence. Facebook uses artificial intelligence methods to better understand its users, us, our posts, and our preferences, so to show us more relevant messages and advertisements. It also uses artificial intelligence methods to create more improved image facial recognition algorithms for photo tagging. Google has been using artificial intelligence for its plain search or voice-enabled search, for its mapping or driverless car projects. Actually, Facebook and Google both work on deep learning methods. Deep learning in these computer networks, they work like the human brain neurons. They tackle the problems, they tackle problems by dividing them into steps and solving them. They try to teach uh, it, they try to teach themselves, the computers, the computer networks, teach themselves to recognize patterns by analyzing large amounts of data instead of relying on the programmers like me to tell them what each pattern represents. So when you use your phone next time, just think. Would you want your device, a device that you carry in your packet, in your, in your pocket, in your bag, would you want it to be your personal assistant? Would you want a robot like my friend here, maybe a more handsome one, to cook dinner for you, to, do, to help you out with the stuff you do every day so you can spend more time with your loved ones, you can spend more time with more important stuff? Would you want, to do, would you want it to happen? Myself, I'm all about the advance in artificial intelligence. But Stephen Hawking's uh, words makes me think again. He thinks the development in artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. He's a great mind after all, right? So I want to address a question who is out there and who is really into this field, artificial intelligence, including myself. What is the future of humanity going to look like when there are lots of robots, artificially intelligent machines that walk among us, sit beside us, walk beside us in the street? Thank you.